Hello. If you go to budget.gov.au, you can watch the 2016 Budget Explainer. In this video, the government tries to justify some of its thinking behind the budget. I thought we could go through that video together and see just how long it takes before the government tries to perpetuate a myth about macroeconomic policy. My name's Gideon Cordova, and this is the 2016 Budget Explainer Explained. The 2016 Budget Explained. Strengthening the nation's finances is key to the government's economic plan. Like any Australian family or business, the government is focused on keeping expenses down to balance the budget and pay down debt. Stop. OK, so we made it 16 seconds. This video is underpinned by two fundamental misconceptions. We'll talk about both of them. Firstly, we need to understand that the government budget is in no way like a household budget. They are not analogous. They're very different. You shouldn't compare them. You are a user of the currency and the government, the federal government, is the issuer of the currency. That's why there's no point making a comparison between the two. Secondly, federal taxes don't fund spending. And that's because the federal government is the monopoly issuer of a fiat currency. We're no longer on a gold standard. The Bretton Woods system of currency convertibility ended in the 1970s. Nowadays, money is not backed up by anything except what the government says. Therefore, the government cannot become insolvent, the, the government cannot go broke. You, as a user of the currency, can go broke. If we didn't have any Australian dollars issued to us in the first place, then we would have no Australian dollars with which to pay our taxes. So, first misconception, we need to remember that the household budget is not like the government budget. Secondly, federal taxes don't fund spending. Taxes have a number of purposes. They can do things like give the currency value, they can control inflation, they can redistribute wealth from one part of the economy to another, and of course they can influence our behaviour. And, and for instance, we have sin taxes or Pagovian taxes on things like tobacco and alcohol, where we put a price on something that we don't want people to do in order to modify their behaviour. But none of those things is about spending. And it's not just me saying this, it's, well, it was first talked about in 1946 by the then chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States, Beardsley Rummel, who wrote a speech that was then published called Taxes for Spending Are Obsolete. So let's deal with this government household budget analogy, which is completely fictitious and erroneous. Right now, Australia has about $286 billion in debt. That debt has not been paid off since 1911. So that debt is 107 years old. Can you go to your local bank and get a mortgage out for 110 years? I don't think so. Between 1949 and 1987, Australia ran budget deficits for 38 consecutive years. So imagine going down to your local bank and saying, I would like to get a mortgage out, please. Can we make the terms of this mortgage, let's say 120 years, and for 38 of those years in a row, I'm not even gonna pay any of it off. You can't do that because you use the currency. The Australian government can and did do that because they issue the currency. Australia's national debt is about $286 billion. Oh no, we're broke. Well, why didn't we go broke at $250 billion of debt or $100 billion of debt or $50 billion of debt or $1 billion of debt? Can you go to your local bank and say, I'd like to get out a loan of $286 billion? No, I didn't think so. And what is that? so-called national debt anyway. Well, the government issues Commonwealth securities, treasury bonds. And for instance, I have a superannuation account and they give you the form that says, do you want to be in high risk investments, in medium risk investments or in low risk investments? The lowest risk investment is those treasury bonds because there's very little chance, in fact, no chance of the Australian government ever going broke. So. Part of that $286 billion of national debt is the safe investment that is earning me a return for my superannuation fund. So it's a good thing. It lets big businesses hedge their bets. It gives them a safe investment that yields a return. So it's not a problem. The national debt is the non-government savings. It's a good thing. Over the last 100 years, on average, Australia has run budget surpluses about one year on every four. So a budget deficit is when the government spends more money than it takes in in tax revenue. So if the government spends $100 million, but at the end of the year they only take back $90 million in taxes, 
that means that they have a budget deficit of $10 million. And over the years, that accumulates, and that's what we call the national debt. Again, in the United States, they ran consecutive budget deficits, as in not paying down any of their so-called debt. They ran that for 27 years, from 1970 to 1997. You can't do that, but a government can. The government issues the money, whereas you use the money. So every time you hear somebody say, if I ran my business like the government, I'd go broke, you can say, well, you're right. You're absolutely right. Find me somebody with a $100 billion debt and I'll find you somebody who's very close to insolvency. Whereas the Australian government has $286 billion of debt because they can't go broke. Yes, they need to issue interest payments on that debt, but those interest payments come in Australian dollars. And the Australian government issues Australian dollars. They can never run out of them. And when you think about it, all of that government debt is actually non-government savings. A government can always pay any obligation that it has that is denominated in its own currency. It can never go insolvent. And it's not just me saying that. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, at the time that he was chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that a government cannot run out of money or become insolvent with respect to obligations denominated in its own currency. It's as simple as that. The government debt is the non-government savings. It's a good thing. What the government owes, you own. You should be very happy about it. So that's why the household budget analogy is completely fictitious. So when in this budget explainer video they say, like any Australian family or business, the government is focused on keeping expenses down to balance the budget and pay down debt, you know that they are spreading a pernicious myth. The government cannot go broke. They have no shortage of Australian dollars because they issue them. They're not like any other Australian household or firm or individual because you and I use the currency, the government issues the currency. Check out the Australian Office of Financial Management's website. So the AOFM or the Reserve Bank of Australia, the RBA, you can check their website as well. And it says the same thing. On the AOFM website, here's a quote. As part of the Australian government's arrangements with the RBA, the RBA provides an overdraft facility to the government. The central bank of the nation has an overdraft facility to the government. Do you have an overdraft facility with the Reserve Bank of Australia? I didn't think so. And then on the Reserve Bank website, it says that this overdraft facility is, quote, strictly limited. <laughs> so how strictly limited exactly? Well, currently, we're running a $39 billion deficit, as in the Australian government has spent $39 billion more than they've taken back in taxes. Can you do that? <laughs> Is your overdraft facility $39 billion? I didn't think so. And if they wanted to, the government could take out $80 billion or $100 billion. In fact, during World War II, we were running government budget deficits that were 25% of GDP. Right now, it's about 2.5% of GDP. So when we're in a pickle, the Australian government can borrow 10 times more than it's borrowing right now. Again, can you do that? Let's say you were really in a jam. The average Australian has a private debt of about $250,000. So let's say I'm really in a pickle. I have a debt of $250,000. Somebody's going to break my legs, you know, if I don't come up with some cash really quickly. So I go down to my local bank branch and say, please, you've got to help me. Somebody's going to break my legs. Can I please have two and a half million dollars? No, you can't. Your line of credit doesn't extend that far. When you're in a jam, you can't just borrow 10 times your current debt. The Australian government can and did. They can do it again whenever they like. That's why you're not the same as the government budget balance. The government, whenever they want to, can take out more money because simply by making laws that require spending, the government creates money. It creates more Australian dollars. And when they tax, they delete Australian dollars. And it really is as simple as that. There are indeed all kinds of voluntary constraints that the government puts on themselves. But since the Bretton Woods system of currency conversion into US dollars and the US dollar being convertible into gold at $35 an ounce, since that system ended in the 1970s, and since Australia floated its currency, in 1983, we have not had a fiscal constraint on the government. The government has much more fiscal space available to it than it lets you think. If the government wanted to, they could raise the deficit to 4.5% of GDP or 10% of GDP. Right now, we spend about, we've, we're in deficit about $40 billion, but can you imagine if next year the government said, we're going to spend $80 billion in deficit spending? So for every school that we spend some money on, double it. For every hospital that we spend some money on, double it. For every military thing that we do, double it. Double the spending. You know what would happen? 
precisely nothing. The government could do it if they wanted to. They just choose not to. They don't have to balance their budget. And we, we can see that for 38 years in a row, they didn't. And it was fine. If you think that there's some big concern that um, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Central Bank, won't listen to the government, uh, if the government asks them, I, we want an extra $100 billion this year, if you're worried that the RBA will just say no, please remember that the Reserve Bank of Australia was set up by an Act of Parliament in 1959. And at any time, its remit, its scope, its purpose, and its, uh, its ability can be changed, amended, or destroyed by the Australian Parliament. They could just sign another law. And a good example of how much capacity the government has to make changes in the way that fiscal policy is implemented, just remember Australia's debt ceiling. We actually did have a debt ceiling, would you believe it? And there was a debt ceiling on how much the Australian government could borrow, and it was created in 2007 by the Rudd government, and it was set at $75 billion. It was increased in 2009 to $200 billion. It was increased to $250 billion in 2011 and $300 billion in May 2012. In November 2013, Joe Hockey, the then Treasurer, requested Parliament's approval for an increase in the debt limit from $300 billion to $500 billion, saying that the limit will be exhausted by mid-December 2013. With the support of the Australian Greens, the Abbott government repealed the debt ceiling over the opposition of the Australian Labor Party. The debt ceiling was contained in Section 5 of the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Act of 1911 until its repeal in December 2013. So there's a great example of a voluntary constraint. And every now and again, we hear this in America that they're coming up to the fiscal cliff and the debt ceiling, and they then threaten each other with whether or not they're going to increase it or, or not, and therefore sequester all of the, or furlough all the government workers and shut down the government. We had one of those in Australia, and then we got rid of it. It's a complete voluntary constraint. When you have a fiat currency, you don't need to defend a gold reserve or peg, or, or peg your currency to somebody else's. You can just issue as much money as you need, and the only real constraint is the real resources. Getting expenditure under control and making sure every taxpayer dollar is spent efficiently will help boost productivity and investment, driving jobs and growth. Stop. We made it to 27 seconds. This is where they say that getting expenditure under control and making sure that every taxpayer dollar is spent efficiently will help boost productivity and investment driving jobs and growth and it kind of makes you think that as long as we just really frugal and the government doesn't spend any money on us that will mean that people who are big rich investors on wall street or in china they will have confidence that we're so frugal and careful with our money that will give them confidence to invest in australia well, as we've already established, we don't need to get all our money from rich people or we don't need to get Australian dollars from China or the United States. The only issuer of the Australian dollar is the federal government via the, the Reserve Bank of Australia. So we don't really need to worry about whether or not the USA or China thinks that we're frugal with our money and therefore they have more confidence in our dollar. doesn't matter. We can always afford anything that's for sale in Australian dollars because the federal government is the issuer of those Australian dollars. But it, this second point brings us closer to a discussion about monetary policy versus fiscal policy. Monetary policy refers to interest rate manipulation, whereas fiscal policy is all about taxation and government spending. Think of it this way. Monetary policy is a very blunt instrument, whereas fiscal policy can be quite targeted. Let's say I wanted to have more jobs and growth in a, a town like Kyabram in central Victoria. I could use monetary policy to try and stimulate that, that region. And the way I could do that is, for instance, to lower the interest rates, and that way lower interest rates might incentivize business owners to borrow more money to build more businesses in Kyabram, and therefore they would hire more workers in Kyabram, and that would help the economy. And you're hoping that they're going to set up their businesses in Kyabram rather than just buy more investment properties in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. So you can see how monetary policy is quite a blunt instrument. Alternatively, the government could use fiscal policy. They could give $12,000 and put it into the bank account of each and every person in Kyabram. That would increase consumer demand because they would have more money to spend. They could also build a business park and say that there's going to be no taxes for anybody that sets up their business in that business park in the centre of Kyabram. Then they could use fiscal policy again to build a high-speed rail line between Melbourne and Kyabra. So all of a sudden there's infrastructure there that businesses can use to bring down production costs and make them more competitive. So you can see that by the government using 
government spending and taxation. They have a much more targeted approach to get jobs and growth into the regions where jobs and growth are needed and also to use taxation to mitigate the consumer demand if there's a risk of inflation. As the budget is repaired, we will look to further ease the tax burden and invest in new priorities. All new government spending in this budget will be paid for by reducing spending in other areas. I'd like them to repair the economy, not the budget. Unemployment, homelessness, green energy infrastructure, the stuffed up MBN. Try repairing that first before you start repairing this balanced budget. We know that the government doesn't need to balance their budget because they're not like a household. We know that if they wanted to, they can take out a, a, a deficit to GDP ratio of 20% if they needed to, to get a stimulated economy. And even the term stimulated economy kind of makes us think that they, they're just giving us this little boost now, but they're going to have to take it away eventually. No, I like to consider it more like what Warren Mosler says, which is you've, you've got this excellent runner and that's the economy and you've got a bag over his head. And stimulus is just taking the bag off. Why would you put the bag back on? It doesn't make any sense. We'll continue to cut waste and unnecessary spending in the future. We are putting in place targeted measures to help ensure everyone pays the right amount of tax and we raise the revenue needed for essential services. It'll be done in a fair and sustainable way. The government will direct savings in welfare to help pay for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and new spending priorities. OK, stop. This one is very alarming. The government will direct savings in welfare to help pay for the NDIS and new spending priorities. So they're saying we're going to rob Peter to pay Paul. Can't we provide dignity to both old people and disabled people? And what about young people and students and the unemployed and infants and veterans and refugees as well? Are there the real resources that we have available to us to match those needs? I think there are. In fact, I know that Australia has a massive population of underutilised people, people who want paid work but simply can't get it. And I think if the Australian government employed all of those people, we would go a long way to ameliorating some of the harm that's caused by homelessness, unemployment, poverty the lack of care for Australia's elderly and a lack of care for Australia's young people. Repairing the budget means we can begin to pay down debt and keep the tax burden lower. Stop. OK. This one says repairing the budget means we can begin to pay down debt and keep the tax burden lower. The government budget, again, is not like a household budget. The government has much more fiscal space available to it than any other business or household in all of Australia. And as long as we are producing the goods that we require to match the demand for all of the new money that is in the system, as long as we do that, then there is no risk of inflation. And if you think that there is somehow a risk of inflation, just look at what's happened with quantitative easing, where they've spent $12.6 trillion, or the equivalent of about $40,000 US dollars per individual in the United States, and there's still no inflation. They're fighting deflation. There is no operational constraint on the government making whatever fiscal decisions they want. So we need to start hassling them to make responsible fiscal decisions. And the government budget isn't a budget in the same way that a household or firm has a budget. It really is just a fiscal statement. If they decide to spend more in that year, then more money will be issued. It's as simple as that. They don't need to wait for taxation to come in before they spend. They can spend whenever they want. They issue the currency. Right now, 80% of Australia's productive capacity is in use and 20% is sitting idle. And the only reason it's sitting idle is nobody has enough Australian dollars to utilise those resources. Well, why doesn't the government who issues the money step in and utilise them? Why doesn't the government implement a federally funded, locally administered job guarantee to employ all of the people who want to work? Why doesn't it do that? Why would it rather give people 40% below poverty wages on Centrelink to do no tasks rather than giving them a decent living wage with benefits in order to create more productive capacity for the society? Why don't they do that? They can. There's no fiscal limitation on them doing so. They won't go broke. They can't go broke. So why aren't they hiring all of the unemployed or underemployed people out there? Now, imagine if you ran a business like that how wasteful that would be. Imagine you ran a business that owns five factories and five trucks and you, you've got your business with five factories and five trucks. Imagine just keeping one of those trucks and one of those factories sitting idle. Why would you do it? It's so wasteful. It's so inefficient. It's not 
showing good business savvy to just leave 20% of your productive capacity on the table, wasting that opportunity to use that production, wasting it forever. Not to mention all the real life human costs of being unemployed and being poor and all of the intergenerational costs of not giving education to the next generation who, who are going to be the ones that have to take care of us when we're older. These are the real costs of leaving all of that productive capacity just sitting idle. For more info on how the budget will affect you, explore budget.gov.au. Okay, I, th I think it is very important that we have aspirational goals. I think aspirational goals are a good thing. Again, running with this business household government analogy, imagine I'm going to start a business and I say that in the company constitution, um, our mission statement is that I'm going to try and poison as few people as possible and it's a very difficult economic climate. So as long as we get through the year with um, a couple of sales and very few poisonings, then I'm going to call it a success. Okay, that's that's one that's one constitution. Now, compare that to somebody else who starts a company and their company says, in their preamble, in their mission statement, they say, we're going to commit to quality 100% of the time. We're going to engage with our customers with respect and dignity, honesty, accountability, uh, and openness. We are going to strive for the very best product all of the time. And we're going to have 5 million sales as a minimum increasing every single year. We're going to leave no resources on the table. We are going to be efficient in everything that we do and behave with honor and authenticity all of the time. Who do you think is more likely to succeed in business? It's the same with politics right now. In Australia, politics is is all about undersizing our expectations. They say it's a tough economic climate, so we're going to have to cut spending on healthcare and education. We're going to have to uh, privatise all of the the national assets. It is so pathetic when they have unlimited fiscal capacity to spend Australian dollars into the Australian economy, and they refuse to. That is the it is the art of downsizing your expectations. We need to expect better. After the Second World War until the 1970s, there was full employment in Australia. That is less than 2% unemployment. There was just frictional unemployment as people transitioned from one job to another, but everybody could get a job if they wanted one, everybody. And we can't seem to do that anymore. Why is that? You know, they said about Jill Stein, who was running for president in the United States, they said, oh, she's just pie in the sky, you know, it'll never happen. Well, what would you rather a politician have? A pie in the sky idea, which only, and, and having them only achieve 10% of it, or, or the politics of today, where they promise you nothing and you get even less. I would rather have aspirational goals in, in politics. I would rather have people be bold enough to stand up and say, yes, we believe in human rights. Yes, we believe in free universal education and free healthcare for everyone, always, forever. Yes, we can always take care of our elderly and our children. No, there will be no one living in poverty. In 1987, Bob Hawke said, he declared to the Australian people that by 1990, there will be no Australian child living in poverty. And today in 2017, there are 730,000 children living in poverty. What's gone wrong? What's happened to our expectations of our politicians? They are public servants. They need to be doing our bidding. And if they won't, then we need to get rid of them and get new ones who will do their job. There is no reason in the richest country in the world, in the richest time in human history, that we can't achieve these things. There is no reason why we need to continually destroy our planet and destroy the lives of the people who live in this community simply because of a lack of Australian dollars. We know that the government issues Australian dollars. They can always continue to issue them until all of us are out of poverty, until all of our energy infrastructure has been turned into green, renewable, sustainable infrastructure, until everyone has access to universal health care. We can do that. In 1969, the American government decided they were going to send people to the moon, and they did. They succeeded. Many said it was impossible and they made it possible. And they went to the moon not because it was easy, but because it was hard. I wish that our politicians today would have as much vision and as much bravery and set aspirational goals and work towards them. Thank you so much for joining me. That's all we've got time for today. I hope you enjoyed our 2016 Budget Explainer Explained. My name's Gideon Cordova. I'll catch you next time.